fixing them up, like getting them for, you know, really good prices, fixing them up and then renting them out. And of course they're unable to get bank financing, but the, the lift in uh, property appreciation from their improvements, but then also the increase in the rents, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Paul David Eskew from Level Up Mortgages, and you're, turning, you're tuning into a dialogue of Consider This, and that's where I speak to lenders who are directly from the source of where you're getting your financing uh, to ensure that uh, home buyers like yourself are considering questions that will likely save you thousands of dollars. Uh, and with this, I have uh, two awesome guests, uh, Valerie Caillé and uh, Jared Stanley from Neighborhood Holdings. How are you both doing? Thanks for joining. Good, good. Thanks, Paul, for having us. Yeah, thanks so much for having us on. I'm, I'm doing well. I'm in Victoria. The sun is shining a little bit. The rain is up, so it's all great. I love it. Uh, and that's a good segue into a bit about your company and what areas you cover. So tell us a bit about uh, Neighborhood Holdings. Sure. Yeah, so Neighborhood Holdings, we're almost, um, we are coast to coast. We do miss a couple of provinces on the way, but we <laughs> land in BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec. Mm -hmm. and Nova Scotia. Okay, beautiful. And uh, I guess before we get to too much of how your process works, I mean, a lot of people watching this are just thinking to themselves, hmm, private lending, hey, or hey, you're not a bank. Are you a loan shark? Uh, so let's address that. I think there's a lot of stereotypes that come from this. And uh, I know you guys have a very unique approach on how you, uh, how you kind of tackle private lending. Uh, from both an ethical and value-driven uh, kind of process. Let's, let's talk about what sets you apart and maybe just for the education of some of the people watching, uh, you know, you as a private lender versus what could be a loan shark versus traditional banks. Yeah, the, the loan shark point is, is always kind of funny. Um, I, I think that stereotype really comes from the media and also pop culture. I mm. mean, how many movies out there uh, is the there? There's this antagonist character who's the loan shark chasing around the protagonist hero while they try to collect their their debts. Yeah. Um, so I think that concept of a loan shark has been around for for decades. You yeah. know, many great some of the greatest films have have been uh, true. focused on on that theme. All the De Niro films. <laughs> yeah, pretty much every single De Niro film. Um, so I, I think that's where that comes from. Um, and then there is also, you know, with the, the mortgage crisis in uh, the United States, um, where people were losing a lot of their homes. Um, and, you know, in some instances, they were feeling taken advantage of. Um, fortunately, uh, Canada actually has really strong consumer protections in place mm -hmm. um, to prevent people from uh, losing their home and then losing more importantly losing the equity that they have in their home mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so as a lender even if you're to go worst case scenario uh, which which for us i mean in the last five years we actually haven't completed a foreclosure so right. um it's never happened with us but say if we were to um we would have to make sure that the property sold for fair market value and then the borrower receives whatever remaining equity is uh, there is in the property mm -hmm. so that's so the loan shark thing, I think it might be applicable more so to different um, industries in Canada, but certainly sure. not. Be and people think market. about people think about oh loan shark oh like twenty percent thirty percent like just criminal rates. Um, but it's funny if you if you think about twenty and thirty percent credit cards, uh, right? with credit cards they they yeah. have those loan shark rates in their pocket. Yeah. So um, in comparison, say if you had a borrower with a bunch of debt. A bunch of credit card debt. I mean, you know, banks sometimes just hand out higher and higher and higher credit limits. Um, whereas for us, you know, we we qualify people. We make sure that they'll be able to pay in in, in some way, and we can actually reduce their debt quite substantially. So you're going from those mm -hmm. high twenty percent interest rates down to uh, you know, say six or seven percent. Totally, yeah, which is a, a, a super, um, you know, fair way to do it. And this is, again, another great segue into, like, what people are probably thinking now. Okay, I'm intrigued, but what are some examples of home buyers who uh, they use private lending, uh, specifically with you? And I, and I see you very much as a transitionary 
lender, right? I think that's kind of, no one wants to be stuck in a private uh, loan forever. So let's talk about, yeah, like, um, you know, best just examples of certain home buyers that have, you've really bailed out, whether it's a consolidated debt on credit card, it seems like we've already been covering that a little bit, but just yeah. other like common uh, positions, especially during these COVID days, we'd love to hear some stories and maybe, maybe even some like basic math just to show people that like it's, the numbers can make sense if you think of opportunity costs, right? Of a uh, property appreciation, if someone keeps paying rent, that could be an issue. Like there's just a lot of other ways to look at things. So wherever you want to tackle that, um, let's illustrate uh, the best examples of buyers that should be thinking about you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I'm glad you asked that. It's, it's actually a difficult question for me to answer. Um, the reason why is um, over the past five years, We've actually closed uh, over half a billion dollars uh, in mortgages, wow. and, uh, and that represents almost 2,000 transactions. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, you know, and each one of those were, you know, we're solving some sort of problem. So there's a lot of situations there. Um, but I can I can think of it offhand just a, a couple common common uh, examples um, that that come up quite cool. often. Um, the first scenario the reason why you know pops in my head it's very similar to what someone would see on hgtv where you have these uh, investors going out into different markets trying to find that investment property right to to fix up and then sell totally um, we see that actually a lot um it varies by province which you know province we see it in but alberta manitoba ontario and quebec and also nova scotia it's it's very popular um, and then in BC and Ontario, it's, it's popular, but more so out of the, the major centers. But it's actually really quite cool because you have these borrowers that um, they're, they're familiar with that whole, uh, you know, property investment, the, the whole, you know, the whole project. Mm -hmm. um, and so they go out, they find a property, they do basic renovations, they touch it up, and then they're in a position now, hey, do we want to sell it or hold on to it um, to rent it out? So mm -hmm. what's great about our, finan our, our financing is that it gives them the option to make that decision because, mm -hmm. because they're doing you know, improvements to the property, uh, it's obviously going to increase its value. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that gives them the opportunity from that uh, aspect to, to sell and actually recoup uh, that profit. Right. Um, but then if they're deciding to rent it out, um, it gives them an opportunity to refinance with the bank um, mm -hmm. at a higher value. And then also um, the, the bank, you know, if they bought the property and say it's vacant, a lot of times it's like an estate sale that they're, they're buying the property from. So uh, it needs a bit of work and the bank's not going to look at that rental income until it's actually tenanted. Right. Yeah. So, so, so they, they're getting turned out by the bank. Bank's like, hey, uh, property is not habitable. There's no one paying rent. So we, we're not going to count the income. You don't qualify based off our very strict debt to income ratios. And therefore, like these people are getting turned down by banks, correct? Yeah. Yeah. These investors are getting turned down by banks. Right. But also, like, they're trying to seize an opportunity to get a good deal. And sure. to get a good deal, you need to be fast. Yes. And you have to beat out other people looking to purchase that property. So um, using our financing, um, they can write an offer almost subject free and um, get an approval from us and close on their transaction. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and really they, a lot of them benefit. So um, for instance, and we can talk about math, I, I have another example I can give sure. you, but um, for each, uh, for each hundred thousand dollars, that you borrow from us, it's about only, it's, it's about 500 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. And because we have flexible prepayment privileges, we can either do a fully open or a closed mortgage with a three month penalty. Um, you know, per hundred grand, you're only paying $500 per month. And so, the, the definition there is open means people can pay off the loan anytime, close means that they, they get charged. They get, there's a prepayment penalty, right? So people don't know what that is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you're paying about $500 per hundred grand. Right. And maybe you only need the mortgage for us with us for two, three months. Right. And then yeah. that's short. totally fine. You know, yeah. short term, easy to qualify for. Um, and 
they're able to to recoup those profits one way or or another so mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them just wouldn't they don't want to risk going the bank route because they don't know if they would get qualified and then the bank some of these people uh, they're they're actually recurring clients of ours um they might not actually sorry the the doorbell might actually ring from my parents oh. and there's no that's door. fun valerie take take the stage Maybe you want to continue on with the, uh, Jared's example here, if you like. Well, I think it literally addresses everyone, including me, anybody business for self, irregular type of income. It could be a, a, a large part of the portfolio can be divorces, people just moving on in the transition phase where, um, let's say someone was staying at home, they can't qualify yet to purchase another place, so they mm -hmm. want to do an inter earlier on both properties. Ooh, what's, what's an inter earlier? You want to define that? <laughs> I mean, that changes. I think the term differ, differ depending on the province. People yeah. will say collateral inter earlier. So until you sell the main house, uh, your, your main, your principal residence, you can purchase another place and have two mortgages on both uh -huh. properties. Right. Um, it could be even more than two properties. Um, the fact that we don't look at the number of doors or, um, like Jared was mentioning, if it's a, an inve a portfolio investment where it's a, under a holding corporation. So the, we can really address case by case and we look at the common sense behind the deal. Let, like com compared on the A side where you really need to check all boxes and you need the GDS and TDS ratio to fit. Mm -hmm. We look at the common sense and the broker's note. So for example, uh, sorry, I know you're, I know you're trying to launch again, but like if I'm still trying to conceptualize that example, you're saying there's two homes and usually with a bank, they're like, hey, um, until you sell this home, we can't, like, we, we, we can only give you a mortgage on the one house versus some people want to want the same mortgage on two homes. And you want to just talk a bit more about that? Because I'm sure people are like, maybe may lost with this. So I just want to make sure that they, they, they can understand. I know we're kind of like in like broker mode, but I always force myself to be like, hmm, like, I want to bring up that visual. And I, I actually want to understand this too, a little bit better myself. Good question. It's true. I speak fast. And with the French accent, a lot of things can be lost. <laughs> so I'll clarify. But I think, uh, even people downsizing, that's another uh -huh. easy example. Okay. Uh, they have a bigger home, they wanna move into a smaller condo, so until they sell and they get the price they want on their current home, mm -hmm. uh, they can still purchase, like does it all miss out on a really good deal, let's say, yep. right. or uh, their dream home, their dream condo. Uh -huh. And then uh, until they sell, we can still balance, uh, let's say 65, 70% loan to value on both properties, which that's gives 30% them- 30% down payment basically, is the equity they have, yep, yep. Yeah, exactly. And then just wait until they sell at the price they want and then reimburse uh, the loan uh, once they sell the property at the price. They, well, they're, they're I can basically get a mortgage without having to sell my place is like the big thing versus the bank would be like, hey, like you don't have down payment or you basically you kind of you kind of bridge financing in that way. Like what's the best way to think about that? Yeah. Uh, just to jump in here. Yeah. The bridge bridge financing is a great way to think. Of right. It. Um, and if someone's just trying to imagine it, basically what's happened is uh, the borrower have, they've found a property that they would like to purchase. Right. Um, and in a lot of cases, this happens actually with um, people in the older demographic um, where their property, their existing property is either free and clear, or what they can do is they can obtain financing with us and then use that financing to purchase their new property. Mm -hmm. And then the, the inter alia aspect or the end in, in Ontario, they call it a cross collateralization. Um, basically the motor, the mortgage is like a blanket over, over two properties. Mm -hmm. So then once their home sells their first home, uh, that then pays, pays either off the debt or pays down the debt. Mm -hmm. So it, like Valerie said, it's, it's a, a really great way to capitalize on a good deal or even just a, a dream home. Sometimes people are out shopping and um, uh, the market is competitive. Uh, in a lot of these cases, for instance, like I, like I mentioned, I'm in Victoria now, but you have Sydney, BC, which is uh, very popular for a certain, different, certain demographic. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people, um, that, you know, they just don't want to miss out on that you know, say rancher or, or condo where, you know, it's very okay. accessible. It's easy to, you know, walk up to your front door and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. um, it just puts them into a good, good position. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying. That's, that's awesome. Okay. So, so that we, we talked about the, the investors, 
uh, the downsizers who kind of need some liquidity or you know some kind something to kind of um, you know let them bridge into another uh, property. Uh, what are some other examples of, of people that get turned down by banks for what could be honestly BS reasons? And uh, are, are you're kind of providing a solution, albeit short term, to get them to bridge or transition to sort of a, a better financial position, ideally, or a better asset position? Yeah. Um, an, another common example that happens a lot is actually uh, pre-sale pur- purchases. Um, Tons of those. I mean, you can ones. imagine. Tons. Yeah, so many. And if you look at, uh, uh, I, I don't know what the stat would be, but yeah. if you look at actually projects that complete on time, I'm on, I would assume that yeah. very few of them complete on time. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The other thing is too, when people buy a pre-sale, uh, sometimes these massive like mega towers, they take several years to complete. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, a lot of things can happen. Um, in several years like if you were to tell me last year that we would all be on a zoom call because there's a global pandemic I would have said yeah that yeah I guess that's possible but it's highly right. unlikely yeah and with that comes job loss with that comes yeah situations that might so if you got pre-approved yeah. today have you considered yeah. where you'll be in a year from now right so there's, there's, I always tell people there's a lot of risk of a pre-sale just because yeah keep things up where they are today but if they if if you're if you know, you usually you're maybe six months away from closing, and if there's anything that if you're not qualifying there, then they're going to need you guys to save them. I'm guessing that's where you're going with this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we come in a lot uh, yeah. just because you know some developers they can delay and they can push out a project. Right. Um, but then when it comes to the notice of completion, they only give borrowers 30 days. You know. No way. Yeah, in some days? cases they only need to give 30 days notice. So. Um, if imagine. they're delaying it, or they, let's say March twenty, March twenty twenty one, there's a couple of properties I finance that are, are going to supposed to close there. You're saying what by uh, February they might be like, hey, we're actually going to close, or hey, we pushed it back, or hey, we're doing, we're going to go early. Well, so what what they'll do is uh, say they'll have like a, a a date that they've estimated to complete. Mm-hmm. So say February, and then getting close to February, they'll be like, oh, you know what, it's going to be another few months. Mm. Uh, then it'll it will go out another few months, right. and then that's when it you know uh, once it reaches that estimated date. Sometimes they'll be like, okay, we're actually ready to close now. We're we're good to close in in thirty days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the developer was able to kick the project down the road three months, but right. then when it comes to to actually saying, hey, you need to get your financing in order, right. uh, it's only about a month. Wow. So it, it can. Uh, it can catch people off guard. Totally. Um, but then another thing is people's lives change. Um, and, you know, and it could be for positive reasons. It could be for sad reasons. It's just that that's life. So mm-hmm. um, they might not be in a position to purchase the property. That being said, um, because a lot of them purchased a property so, you know, so far in the past, mm-hmm. um, the properties will have appreciated. Uh, in that time. So a property that they may have bought in, in downtown Vancouver for, you know, 400 grand might not, uh, might be worth 800 grand today. Mm-hmm. So for them, it's like they need to close on this property so that they can then list it for sale and then take that equity out of it. Right. So for us as a lender, we know the value of the property and it makes sense. Like mm-hmm. the person um, we'll be receiving a bit of additional funds from us so that they'll be able to at least afford, afford our payments during that period. But ultimately their exit strategy is to sell the property. Mm-hmm. So um, again, we, we, we haven't had any foreclosures actually go yeah. through. So in these situations, those loans actually perform very well. And uh-huh. They, uh-huh. they always end up selling their property. So. I love it. And this goes into a bit of, um, I guess people are wary of doing with private lenders. They're like they're, they think to themselves, Oh, well, what's the fine print? Um, what are things I should keep in mind? Uh, people are wary, right? So, so maybe with this, well, obviously you're underwriting so well that there have been foreclosures. So I'm, I'm guessing you're not super loosey goosey. As Valerie was saying, like you guys do have things that are really important. So, so what are some things people should consider? when working with yourself or any private lender around, again, terms and conditions, fine print, just things they should just know and not make assumptions on 
uh, just so they're like, just so there's no surprises, ideally. Or yeah. Think they should ask their broker. Yeah, you know what? Um, this might not be the best answer, but I, I think that borrowers really shouldn't be wary if they're working with a mortgage professional that they right. trust that is taking the time to go through those terms and conditions with right. them. Um, and if they are not working with someone that's taking that time to go through the terms and conditions with them, sure. um, they should consider getting a second opinion or just keep pressing to get the answers. That's right. all. Like, don't yeah. be afraid yeah. to ask questions. No, um, sure. But that being said, with, with any lender, it doesn't matter if it's a private A or mm -hmm. B, a, a consumer always wants to be aware of the total cost of financing. Right. And especially over the period of time that they're, they're borrowing the funds for. Mm -hmm. Because imagine, like, you know, our loans are, are fully open, right? So they, they can pay out at any time mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, taking a, a five-year fixed deal with the bank uh, at a low interest rate and then paying right either caught. a three-month interest prepayment penalty or an IRD and having right. to jump through all these additional hoops. So it's like, what, what's, if you only need funds for six months, what's that true cost of, true cost of borrowing? Right. And cost right. of borrowing, you mean like, I need something for six months, I see a low rate, I'm going to do the five-year thing. Oh, crap, now I've got to pay a $40,000 penalty to, you know, uh, CIBC. Cool. Yep. Um, well, what's lower, the $40,000 penalty or, you know, the, the, the $500 per $100,000 you know, fee with you times whatever three months. So I guess it's, yeah. You can just so it, it's just really there. working with a mortgage professional that that gives a really well thought out plan and then explains all the risks to mm -hmm. you. So in the bridging uh, example, yeah, you know, if I was the mortgage professional, I would just be saying, hey, you know, your interest of there will be uh, additional interest costs if your existing property doesn't sell. So you need to work closely with your realtor to make sure that, you know, he is marketing the property, of, you know, effectively, right? So, right, this is the example of you, try, you, you get a mortgage on, I guess, the subject or the new property, you still have the existing one, you mm -hmm. will pay this off as soon as that's sold, and, the, and if your cur current place isn't sold, then you just, you're, you're kind of just every month paying five, six, seven percent, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right, so just a bit of forecasting there, because yeah, I mean, and, and again, like most people I'm guessing, We'll do one year terms like you, most people will have an exit plan let's talk about the, a bit about the exit plan and, and what you should think people should consider or ask their broker or their bank uh when they're trying to think of exit plans uh, maybe like the bank they're going to afterwards like what are some common things people should have on their checklist as far as exiting uh, a private loan yeah um so i mean the exit plans are are fairly simple like yeah um or, or at least the overarching objective mm -hmm. of the exit plan or is fairly simple it's you you almost have two avenues which is either sell or refinance mm -hmm. so it's you can see is our financing um you know in the, in the case of selling a property you're looking at our financing really um, as a uh, a transitionary step to give you additional breathing room while you do whatever needs to be done um, to be able to sell your property so Maybe that's doing small improvements around the house or finding a realtor or um, finalizing some of the uh, agreements between parties in, in the case of a, you know, a marital breakdown or something like that. Um, it's really to provide them breathing room. Um, and then in the case of uh, uh, refi, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because then you're relying on getting yourself qualified with the banks. So, in that situation, uh, the mortgage professional should lay out a plan. It's like, okay, your credit is this, or say the bank doesn't like this, um, so we need to overcome um, these certain um, milestones. Mm -hmm. So, I love it. And Valerie had a comment here, actually, so respectfully in the comment box on our awesome Zoom. So that when you talk about that, you're talking about uh, there's another use case here. I think you're still on mute. Sorry. Uh, these things can be finicky. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt Jared. Sure. Jared. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was just 
thinking it is a transition uh, period where people are using this bridge financing, but in a way there's some other cases where people don't necessarily, they, they don't want to sell or they can't qualify again on the A side for any, for multiple reasons. It could be because they have too many doors, too many properties, or they have an employment that um, just doesn't fit the criteria of the A side. So I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on that front, Jared, when people don't want to sell and want to stay on the alternative side. Yeah, it sounds counterintuitive. I mean, don't people want to have an exit plan or sometimes it, it gets, does it make sense to stay? That's kind of that's my next question anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. It, it really all depends on people's circumstances. Um, and again, it's just, it's still, like even if they want to own the home, um, they want to stay with a private lender, um, it, it's really, there always is going to be an exit strategy, it's just a matter of when, right? So for instance, you know, we, and another, this is another borrower example of ours is we have some borrowers in our books that are fund managers. Um, there are some that, you know, are multimillionaires. Like we have a couple of borrowers. We, hmm. we have net worths above $20 million. Wow. Uh, and they have these massive portfolios of properties. Hmm. And for them, really, you know, they don't want to sell their property. It doesn't make sense. But they're also unable to qualify for a financing. Um, so what they really need to do is restructure everything so then they can get commercial financing over, a, a, a you know, a bunch of their assets or even, you know, apply with private banking to then move these to complete on these purchases and move them. So they're buying time, basically. It sounds like they're buying, they're buying time, basically. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and then like for the, um, you know, some of the other examples um, where where people just, you know, they don't have uh, traditional sources of income. Um, of course, they can work on restructuring their finances so that they can be a, in a better position to qualify, but that could take three years or so. Um, and there's a trade-off between you either pay a low interest rate or you pay a lot of taxes, right? For self-employed, so, yeah. There's that trade-off there. Um, and then also for you know rental properties, say if you're actually getting a really good um, return on your rental property and, and it's a pretty high cap rate, um, you know, sometimes our interest rate actually isn't that high in comparison to the rent that they're receiving. Right. Right. So, and that's an opportunity costing. So a lot of people say, Paul, I mean, if I don't qualify for the bank right now, I'm just gonna wait it out for one year, two years, maybe longer. Like, have you run the math around you paying rent for the next year, the property you really want to get going up, let's say 4% a year, and the rental income you're missing out on, not to mention, like, have you thought about, like, what you are missing out on if you don't act now? But people are like, like, it's, it's, it is expensive to be cheap. I think it's the best way to phrase that. And yeah. I just, I think that's kind of what you're illustrating, that the cap rates and the amount, amount of money you're making from the rent, like, it, it, if it's, like, if, if it costs money to make a lot of money, What's the problem with taking on smart debt? The whole thing I think is leveraging yourself in a smart way. Yeah. I think that gets totally lost in this game. People are just kind of uh, acting from a position of fear where if you run the numbers, I do on an Excel document, um, it seems like yeah. it can be a lot more, a lot less intimidating. Oh yeah, for sure. Like in, we have countless examples uh, and this always makes me a little bit, um, you know, jealous because I, I, I really love properties. Um, like they're just, an interest in mine. And of course I used the HGTV example earlier because I have spent a lot of time watching <laughs> those silly uh, HGTV awesome. programs uh, where people, uh, you know, fix up and transform properties. But in Quebec, we, we have a lot of examples of people purchasing say uh, duplex, triplex, uh, quad, quadplex, um, and fixing them up, like getting them for, you know, really good prices fixing them up and then renting them out. And of course they're unable to get bank financing, but the, the lift in uh, property appreciation from their improvements, but then also the increase in the rents, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, wow. so, so in those cases, and then, you know, we've been doing this with some of them for several years, but then the Montreal market has really taken off too, right? Totally. So, totally. 
those guys, if they, uh, or those people, I should say, um, if they, if they said, you know what, I'm going to wait, oh, man, there's, there's some, uh, I think one of them, he bought it for, no, oh, 500,000. And he's yeah. been with us for two, almost three years now. And yeah. it's, it's worth close to a million bucks. Wow. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And it, and it's exciting for me to see these success stories. Sure. Uh, Cause it's, you know, you can't be happy um, doing what you do every day if you're not helping people. So of course, of course. when you see these people, you know, hit these home runs or, or even just a successful play, you know, mm -hmm. um, it is very exciting. Yeah, no, that's amazing. That's a great uh, way to sort of start to wrap up and, and things up on a high note. I mean, my biggest takeaway so far have been, I mean, obviously we've educated around how, you know, most private lenders are not loan sharks. They're actually great tools uh, because look, let's face it, the bank uh, check boxes are getting ridiculous. I think the rates right now have never been lower, but also have never been harder to get a mortgage, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of people think that um, private mortgages, people do it from a position of weakness, which sometimes is the case and you kind of need it to bail you out. But especially the, the latter half of the interview, you prove that there are people who have over $20 million in assets that see it as a strategic thing to leverage themselves properly. And I think if you run the numbers on, again, uh, cap rate, as you said, opportunity cost, and, and just basically, if you're really planning ahead, then suddenly these 5 6%, 7% or more interest charges are really puny compared to the big picture. And I think that's something yeah. that people uh, just don't think about as much. And I think brokers should be walking people through that strategy because there is strategy there. All right? it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, you're playing off. It's not just defense. Exactly. No, good point. I mean, you mentioned that some people uh, would think that private lending is, is uh, something you might use at a, at a moment of weakness. Right. Um, but even for our low credit score borrowers, um, I never really see it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I see it actually as a moment of strength um, because these borrowers are coming to us and they're coming to their mortgage professional and they are being very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They are saying to their mm -hmm. mortgage professional, like, hey, this, these are the problems that have uh, occurred in my life and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm here to fix them. Yeah. It's the same thing, someone showing up to the gym, just yeah. wanting to get healthier. Right. It's, it's them coming, um, want, coming to us, wanting a better life. And we, we are, I believe that we are helping them do that. Mm -hmm. No, and that's an, a great, important uh, clarification, of course. Uh, Valerie? Well, I was just going to add the fact that, I mean, I've worked for a bigger corporation, and mm -hmm. in this case, uh, we are quite a small team, even though we are a national lender. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, well, the administrative uh, team dealing with the um, with the boards, and I'm dealing mostly with the broker team. Mm -hmm. But it's all again case by case, personal approach, and the aftercare is very important because at the end, we're like one dollar here is one dollar there is the same that we're like that people are boring what makes a difference is really how we treat people and the human level behind it and the broker when they want to help their client we continue this process and we just don't play ping pong like we're two separate entities we work together mm -hmm. and after we know that the borrower will go back to his broker exactly to move on with that transition stage mm -hmm. so the importance of treating people humanly and sure helping them moving forward is a big part of the industry because the competition is big. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have that, I don't think we can really survive. So it makes a big difference compared to, you know, where you just, everything can be checked boxes online where you never meet the person, you never right. know, like basically who you're dealing with. Totally. You just yeah. kind of on, that, on that, uh, on that note, uh, it's funny to hear from borrowers when they're paying us out, um, they'll say to our administrative team who are wonderful, they're like, oh, I wish I could just stay with you guys forever. You're <laughs> always there when you call. That's awesome. And um, they, they just love speaking with our administrators because um, our administrators treat them, as Valerie said, as, as other humans. Like, sure. Um, you know, and uh, it's always wonderful to see. And, and a lot of times yeah. borrowers say, well, I wish you had super low rates and I could just stay with you forever. But it's also <laughs> right. very exciting for us 
um, mm. to see these these borrowers kind of graduate to the next step. Just no, it's to, great. Yeah, and 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 look, you you think the the the, the bar would be set at a level where everyone gets treated like a human, and they get semi regular response rates, and then someone takes the time to explain a concept to them. But guess what? Uh, a lot of the traditional banks are so busy. And quite frankly, not super incentivized. Like they don't incentivize their people. I mean, they, they've got, of course, commissions. But when you talk to a commission-only broker <laughs> who really needs to deliver and be available for you, they're going to hustle more for you. And also, a lot of private lenders are hungrier for business because you know we're on a mission to, and we're covering a whole different niche of the industry. And, and let's face it, a lot of people really need the help, right? Who are going to private mm -hmm. lending really need it. So you have to be uh, treating people with respect timely professional strategic and i hate to say a lot of the banks are dropping the ball there and mm -hmm. they and that's why they have the stereotype of just getting completely as people look at them this big organization and, and sort of soulless in a way because that's kind of what they are right so i think yeah people who want to uh, work with people that are going to be there for the life sort of the journey of their uh, really their life and in their in the real estate uh, um kind of i guess adventure super important uh, final words, things people should consider when talking to a private lender and anything you want to, uh, kind of end off with any last words. It is an industry that we estimate around $55 billion a year. Mm -hmm. So it could address everybody. Um, anybody can benefit from it. And I think it's just looking at the creative side of what solution can fit your needs mm -hmm. and having more tools in your box is just an extra solution and like you mentioned earlier it is it is about having a plan making the the calculate the calculation that's mm -hmm. necessary to what works best and what can help you move forward or mm -hmm. save you money but work with your broker uh on this and uh, yeah it is always a solution that's there that's growing and that's a big part of the market i love it uh Valerie, Jared, uh, this has been a, a fruitful conversation. Uh, lots of things to consider from this. I hope you will consider uh, neighborhood holdings uh, throughout their, uh, their mortgage journeys. Uh, you've been super helpful. I will, I will link to the show notes, uh, of course, your website and how to get in touch. Uh, but with that, uh, thanks again. And for those watching, keep leveling up your living. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, guys. You bet. Yes, much appreciated. Bye for now.